it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Robert Yarrow. Robert Yarrow was, until last year, he's now emeritus professor of practice at the University of Pennsylvania and specializing in land use, urban development, infrastructure planning for mega regions and metropolitan region, regions, areas. He, was, he also was uh, president of the Regional Plan Association for almost, for over 25 years. Um, that's headquartered in Manhattan and RPA is America's oldest and most distinguished independent metropolitan research and advocacy group. Uh, Bob also established and led the, what's called the Civic Alliance to rebuild downtown New York following the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center. Uh, he served on the faculties of the University of Massachusetts, Harvard, and Columbia. Um, he's worked for, at UMass as the founding director of something called the Center for Rural Massachusetts. He's also served as a city planner at the, in Boston and as chief planner and deputy commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Management. So he's worked in government as well. Uh, today's going to be talking about a big project. Bob is, uh, thinks big very big. It's called Rebooting New England, and it's an initiative to build a high-performance rail network between New York and Boston as part of a broader effort to revitalize the, the region's mid-sized city. He also co-chairs uh, in my New York, New Jersey Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group, and that's how we got to know each other, which is advancing a proposed system of offshore and perimeter barriers to protect the nation's largest urban area from future storm surges. So welcome, Bob, and we look forward yes. to your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Malcolm. Thanks for that introduction, and uh, delighted to be with your uh, class today and with the, with the folks at uh, Stony Brook. Um, I'm going to focus today on on what well what actually began as Reboot New England, uh, but we've renamed North Atlantic Rail. Uh, as essentially, it's a it's a proposed seven state. Uh, high-speed and high-performance rail network serving uh, the six New England states and downstate New York, <clears throat> including Long Island. And uh, we've, we've the, the new name basically has to do with uh, our friends on Long Island when we use, use the, uh, the term reboot New England. Uh, they said, well, what are we chopped liver? We're not part of, <clears throat> part of New England. And so we've come up with this more inclusive name, North Atlantic Rail. It is, uh, it is an economic development strategy for, uh, for the seven state region and in particular for communities on Long Island and in, the, and in the six New England states that have been left out of the prosperity of the last 30 or 40 years. There's a network of more than 30 uh, mid-sized cities across New, uh, across New England, for example, that have simply never recovered from the loss of manufacturing 40 and 50 years ago. And the idea is to reconnect these places with each other and with New York and Boston, the two engines of, of the uh, Northeastern and, and indeed of the national economy uh, with a high speed rail network and a, a connecting the two big cities, <clears throat> New York and Boston. I'll go into the detail in a moment. And then, and then, uh, and then uh, connecting inner city rail lines and regional rail lines that connect all of these places to each other. Um, <clears throat> this actually began in, in a way with a project I did at, uh, at, at Penn, University of Pennsylvania, 2004. I ran a graduate planning studio called Plan for America 2050, and uh, which was basically a look at, at where population growth and demographic and, and employment growth were going to lead the nation and what infrastructure uh, systems were needed. One of the things we discovered there was, was, was the emergence of uh, we, we identified 11 emerging mega regions, we called them, networks of metropolitan regions like the Northeast uh, that were, where you have uh, uh, independent cities and metropolitan areas that have economic and infrastructure and natural system ties, in some cases, cultural ties and historic ties <coughs> with each other. And the idea was that if we could build, uh, if, if we could strengthen the infrastructure connections between these places, we could create synergies between the economies of, of these metropolitan regions that we'd never been able to achieve before. Uh, it, it, it turns, so this is a concept that actually has been, has, has been influential uh, more outside of the United States than in the United States, that places like China and Japan and Europe, uh, Korea have adopted, adopted the mega region idea and have organized national infrastructure and economic 
development strategies around this idea. Uh, we, we, we learned early on that these places like the Northeast that are 300 to 600 miles across are too large to be easily uh, accessed by automobile and too small to, to be uh, uh, efficiently uh, accessed by airplane. And the mode of choice around the world has become high-speed rail systems, uh, rail systems, trains that are doing more than 100, and averaging more than 150 miles per hour, up to two and a quarter, 250 mile per hour services. 27 countries have adopted, uh, have, have built or are building high-speed rail networks. Uh, the US is not, the US is now behind uh, not only Europe and China and Japan and Korea and Taiwan, but behind uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Indonesia, uh, Morocco, Turkey, a bunch of places that we shouldn't be lagging behind. And so North Atlantic Rail is a proposal to, to build this high-speed rail network you know, in, in, from New York City north in, across New England. There are, there are uh, uh, comparable initiatives in what Amtrak calls the south end of the Northeast Corridor between New York and DC to upgrade passenger rail service there. Uh, they have the objective of delivering 90 minute travel time between New York and DC. We're, we're proposing to do 100 minute travel time from New York to, uh, uh, to Boston with a new alignment that would actually extend east from Penn Station in Manhattan on Long Island uh, using, using a, um, abandoned and underutilized freight rights of way, freight lines, <coughs> power rights of way, that sort of thing to get from Manhattan and, and Jamaica to uh, Ronkonkoma, uh, and then a new, uh, using the power line that runs from Ronkonkoma to Port Jefferson, there'd be a stop at Stony Brook, and then it would dive under the sound south of, of uh, Port Jefferson and in a, into a 16 mile long tunnel to Milford, Connecticut, where it reconnect with the existing uh, Northeast Corridor just west of New Haven, and then extend on, on to Boston via Hartford and Providence. Uh, that's the big idea, and, uh, and attached to it is, and, and we see this as being transformational for these mid-sized cities. One of which is Hartford, Connecticut, and working with Senator uh, Congressman John Larson, the congressman from from Hartford, at his request, we've we've been collaborating with the city and a, a civic group uh, called Hartford 400 on this initiative to modernize the the transportation infrastructure of the city, essentially to take advantage of this new economic advantage that would be created by the high-speed rail connection. Hartford is currently uh, currently just totally isolated from the uh, metropolitan economies of New York and Boston. With, uh, with North Atlantic Rail, it would be uh, basically under an hour to both New York and to Boston. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Kip Bergstrom, is an economic development expert, and he <clears throat> he determined that, that if you swung an arc, if you wanted to look for the, the the biggest technology centers in the United States. She said, if you swung an arc uh, uh, about 150 miles in in, uh, in radius around major cities, uh, the, the one with the largest concentration of tech industries, uh, is not surprisingly, would be San Jose, California in the Silicon Valley. Uh, anybody want to guess what the second one would be if you did that, did the same thing? We have any Input here, uh, Alex, uh, Malcolm, Melanie, anyone else want to jump in? Well, the answer is Hartford, Connecticut becomes the second largest uh, kind of tech center in the United States. If, again, if you, if you pull it within, a, within uh, an hour's travel time of New York City and of Boston, those are, the big, those are two big tech engines and tech economy engines in the national economy, currently totally isolated from Hartford, but with, with North Atlantic Rail. Hartford becomes the center of the galaxy as opposed to the edge of the known universe. Um, so I'm gonna jump into the presentation here and you'll see it's a little about each of these projects. So Melanie, go to the next slide. Uh, again, we started out, uh, I, I began this with another one of these Penn Studios in 2017, which was called Reboot New England. And the idea was to reboot the economy of these mid-sized, these old manufacturing centers across New England. There are a total of about 30 of these places, but these are the, <clears throat> the most notable ones. Um, and, uh, and let's go to the next slide. Um, our first phase proposal would be in these, and what we did is we went to each of the states and said, tell us what your highest priority rail investments are. And uh, you know, what we heard from Connecticut was improve the New Haven line from New Haven to Manhattan. 
in in uh, and they also wanted to upgrade it's uh, a line called the Hartford line that ex that provides commuter service between New Haven and Hartford and Springfield, uh, and then and then a new uh, passenger rail line called East West Rail running on an existing freight right away uh, between Springfield and Worcester in Boston to, to provide basically hour and twenty minute uh, service uh, between those places, and then some judicious investments in the regional rail network. Uh, in Eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island to connect Providence better to Boston and and all these you can see these other old older manufacturing centers that would be pulled into the orbit of Metro Boston. The second phase of this thing, if you go to the next slide, is the high speed trunk line, which would run and I just have to advance us. So I guess can people see it in the bottom that it runs east on Long Island? And we've been working with uh, with Steve Ballone and Laura Curran, the Suffolk and Nassau County executives, of the Long Island Association, and others uh, on this to, on this right away. Uh, there's uh, strong support for it. There will be no, NIMBY, not in my backyard, opposition to it. When you do anything on Long Island, that's how life is. And uh, but we think that that there's enough uh, of a, a strong rationale and political support for doing this. This would be a real game changer for Long Island, which I've described as the. Uh, the largest cul-de-sac in America. You know, it's just essentially kick it off the island without going through New York City, and this would enable a, uh, a connection to New England. Imagine, you know, being able to get from Stony Brook to uh, to uh, Yale or New Haven in 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, be able to get from Ronkonkoma to Manhattan in 30 minutes. It's currently what an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. So it cuts travel time by by more than half. Uh, and and you'd be uh, and from Stony Brook to Boston in a little over an hour, an hour and ten minutes or something like that. Uh, and and then with a number of stops elsewhere on the island, there'd be stops at, uh, at Ronkonkoma, MacArthur, <coughs> the uh, Route 110 corridor near Republic Airport, uh, 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 the Nassau Hub, which has been envisioned for 50 or 60 years as the new economic mixed use center. Of Nassau County is missing only one thing, and that is it doesn't have it decent transit uh, uh, rail connection, and this would provide that. Stop at Jamaica, JFK, and then on to Penn Station, New York. Uh, next slide, please. And then we've we've outlined, this is kind of the, the heart of a, uh, a, net, a larger network of, of intercity rail connections to Northern New England and uh, Western Massachusetts uh, and, and other lines that connect all of these places to each other and to, and to the, the, the high-speed trunk line, provide service into Boston and New York. Uh, so that's the vision. Now, the reason that th this is a pipe dream at the moment, it's gone. I, I, I have outlined a, you know, a, 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 a uh, what's the word I want, but, uh, you know, the, a, a line that goes from a, a zany idea or crazy idea to something that is slam dunk that about to happen. You know, we've been at the uh, uh, zany idea stage for a couple of years with this thing. But the thing that's that's allowing this to take off is that President Biden has proposed a $2 trillion national infrastructure program. Uh, and the incoming administration has, has said they are looking for projects that do several things. One, they make sense as infrastructure projects, they make sense as transportation improvements, but they also provide short and long-term job creation, which this does, that they revitalize left behind communities, which this does, that they uh, provide special economic assistance to uh, to uh, majority uh, uh, Black and Latino communities, which many of these places are, uh, that, that they provide important climate benefits. This project gets the existing Northeast Corridor out of the flood zone uh, in Connecticut uh, and, and into an inland corridor on Long Island and inland, inland New England. Um, and it also uh, pulls uh, literally you know, millions of tons of carbon out of the intercity and regional mobility system of the seven state region. So it has enormous climate benefits. So uh, according to at least some of the people in the incoming, in the Biden administration, they said, hey, this project ticks off all our boxes. It is a, uh, a the, all, the whole total of the whole thing is a $105 billion proposal, which uh, used to sound like a lot of money. Um, it would represent 5% of Biden's uh, proposed $2 trillion, which may be larger than that by the time they're done in the Congress, uh, national infrastructure program, uh, serving a region with 
11% of the nation's population and 14% of its economy. So we think this is totally in line with the scale of the challenge, the economic and, and climate and racial and social justice uh, 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 challenges facing this seven state region. Um, so, and we're working very hard to, to see that this is a, that the, the seven state congressional delegation and others, you know, the business leadership and civic leaders get behind this thing to, to encourage the Biden administration to include this in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the, president, the president's program. Um, our co-chairs are uh, two powerful uh, business and government leaders, the, uh, uh, the mayor of Hartford, Connecticut, Luke Bronin, who was a former assistant secretary of the treasury in the Obama administration has uh, terrific connections in Washington and with the new administration. Uh, and uh, Doug McGarrah, who is the, who is the uh, chairman of, a, of a, a RPA counterpart in Boston uh, called a better city. <clears throat> and uh, but, uh, somebody who's had a lot of experience in public life was an assistant to uh, Senator Paul Sagas. He, he was the uh, 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 chief of staff to Secretary of Transportation in Massachusetts when they did the big dig and was counsel to the big dig project, the, uh, currently the largest infrastructure project since the Panama Canal. If we do North Atlantic, we pull off North Atlantic Rail, it will be several times the size of the, of, of the, the big dig in Boston. So that, and, and mentioning the big dig, this gets me on to the, the, the rest of, of the Hartford 400. Go on to the next slide, Melanie, please. This shows the whole network built out. And uh, uh, you know, this is how this thing could end up. We're working with folks in Northern New England to see if there are other, one project that <clears throat> we've added is, a, is a, a link between Burlington, Vermont, the only metropolitan center in Vermont to Montreal, which even though it's just 60 or 70 miles away is you know, almost an overnight trip at the moment. So a high-speed connection across the border there makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, and this line that goes up to Southern Vermont to Brattleboro, uh, we're, we're now hearing that Vermonters and places in Western New Hampshire want to see it extended to uh, White River Junction and, you know, and uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth College is. Next slide, please. Uh, this, shows, uh, this shows how uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a special attention on the Connecticut Valley um, where, uh, where we've been working with, with members of Congress so an interesting alignment here. It's the uh, congressman from Springfield, uh, Richie Neal, is the chairman of Ways and Needs in the House. The congresswoman from New Haven, Rosa DeLauro, is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House. And the congressman from Hartford in the middle uh, is on Ways and Means and is a very influential, he's the, uh, the dean of the New England congressional delegation. And the, the three of them are advocates for this thing and want to see it happen and are working very hard to make it happen. So we focused on the benefits that it would provide to the Connecticut Valley between New Haven and, and Springfield. Next slide. <clears throat> and this map shows that you know, the Valley is the major population center uh, between New York and Boston. And again, this rail connection you know, puts the Valley at the center of the economic geography of the, of the Northeast, as opposed to being an outlier, which is what it's been until recently. You know, the Northeast corridor runs along the coast from Providence down to New Haven and bypasses Springfield and Hartford all together. Next, please. Um, this shows the Valley is, you know, is, is, is uh, just is, is promoting itself as the knowledge corridor, 40 colleges and universities. The two outliers on the right-hand side are the University of Connecticut in stores that is currently out in the wilderness, isolated. And much the way Stony Brook is isolated from major population centers. And then just south of that is Eastern Connecticut uh, uh, State University in Willimantic. Uh, this, this project changes that and that uh, uh, stores, which currently is a very difficult drive, you know, drive from, uh, from stores to, uh, uh, from Yukon to Hartford or to Boston, would be 13 minutes from uh, downtown Hartford and something like 45 minutes to downtown Boston. So it changes everything. Hartford begins to have the same kind of economy that other state capitals that, uh, across the country that have state university flagship campuses like Columbus and Indianapolis, and Lansing and Addison and Austin, Texas, all of which are doing really well because they've got both state capitals and, and state flagship universities. And Hartford would develop that same kind of, of relationship. Next, please. <clears throat> 
So we've begun to look at how, you know, we think Hartford is, you know, it, it really does become the center of, of, of this, this new economic geography in the Northeast, which, which it has the potential to become. The question is, what do we have to do to, to achieve or to take advantage of that potential and realize that potential? And uh, so we've been working with with uh, with uh, government and civic groups in Hartford to develop a concept that we're calling uh, Hartford 400. Next, please. Uh, again, the idea it, it's focused on the 400th anniversary of the city of Hartford, which which is uh, uh, coming up in 2035, so 14 years from now. And we've we've identified a set of of big infrastructure projects that would allow Hartford to realize that potential by by in time for its 400th anniversary. Next, please. This shows the you know the connections to the rest of the valley, the economic corridor, the natural corridor, uh, the, the knowledge corridor again, linking New Haven and, and Springfield. Next, please. Uh, uh, you know we see that both of these projects as catalysts for the economic and social transformation. Some of the some of the objectives uh, uh, that the Biden administration is seeking with, uh, with its infrastructure program. Next, please. This shows the relationship to uh, Bradley Airport, uh, Bradley International up between Hartford and Springfield. Next, please. And we're, we're looking at various ways of, of connecting the rail service uh, between Hartford and Springfield to Bradley. Current, currently, it's a very congested uh, highway trip on, on I-91 I and not a very reliable uh, trip because of congestion. Uh, next, please. Uh, so these show, you know, the integration of rail and road and highway and transit um, and, uh, and downtown development, uh, both in Hartford and then East Hartford across the Connecticut River. Next, please. Uh, Again, using the punch list that, that the Biden people have given us, here's, we, we believe that we can achieve all of these uh, uh, outcomes that are outlined here, the jobs, equity, climate, growth for the whole region. Next. Uh, and we've been working with a, a, a Los Angeles-based urban designer who's done a lot of work with regional plan over the years, Doug Suzman, who's come up with these uh, really attractive and compelling images of what the transformation of of downtown Hartford and East Hartford could look like if we could redesign the highway network around the city. Like most other <clears throat> American cities in the 1960s and 70s, we bulldozed vast areas of, uh, of, of uh, urban, urban fabric, uh, and in many cases in minority communities, just blasted highways through urban centers, destroying uh, neighborhoods, separating minority neighborhoods from downtowns and so forth. Hartford, you know, it's like they went out of their way to, to uh, uh, destroy uh, the urban fabric of, of Connecticut's capital city and, and East Hartford across the river. Next, please. Um, the existing highway system you know, blasts right through the center of, of both cities, interchanges that are in, in, the, in the core of, this, of the cities. Uh, in the middle of this image, on the east side of the river, is a is a interchange between four highways that is no, lo, known locally as the Mixed Master. You know, it, 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 it bas they basically blew up uh, half of downtown East Hartford to build this highway interchange, uh, and we want to undo the damage. Okay, next please. Um, we've got these uh, interchanges that are right in the center of the city. You can see the Mixed Master highlighted here, and the others. Next, next please. Uh, we've been working with Connecticut DOT on, on a set of alternatives and have and ended up with this proposal to tunnel a piece of I-84 uh, under the city. And again, this is all made possible by the same tunneling technology that we the automated tunnel boring machines that we would use to do the 16 mile long uh, uh, rail tunnel under Long Island Sound, which allows us to get, we, we have uh, the, the existing highway uh, goes within, oh, I don't know, 100 yards of the state capitol and Bushnell Park, the, the, the uh, beautiful central park of downtown Hartford. This removes it in, uh, by putting it into a tunnel and then, and then relocates and redesigns these uh, interchanges and gets them out of the center of the city. There's another, uh, another uh, highway that goes north of downtown that currently separates the mostly African-American north end from downtown. 
that would be tucked into the hillside and, uh, and then capped, creating a new green space where there is now an eight lane highway. And then the highway interchange is relocated out of the downtown to, to an area called the North Meadows. It, you know, it's currently lo, you know, low grade uh, uh, warehousing and that sort of thing would be relocated. Same thing over on the East Hartford side, <coughs> the mixed master gets relocated out of the center of the city and a piece of, of uh, highway gets capped or tunneled. Next, please. And this shows you know, what the transformation uh, ends up looking like. So this is the existing uh, 8491 interchange, which is right in downtown Hartford, right along the Connecticut River. And, uh, and, and just a, a cuts and, and, and uh, I-91 in particular and this interchange cut the city off completely from the river. That was the reason Hartford was settled here in the first place. It was the head of navigation on the Connecticut River. Next, please. Uh, and we replaced that, that uh, bowl of spaghetti of highway interchanges with this. This is uh, uh, I-91 uh, is undergrounded and then, and then a new surface boulevard that we're calling River Road is built on, on top of it, pull, pulled back from the river, creating a new uh, a riverfront park and esplanade uh, that is accessible to the public and attractive and all the rest of it. Hartford, once again, be, in time for its 400th anniversary, becomes a riverfront uh, city. Next, please. Uh, we, we currently have only two places where the public can get to, to the river, very difficult connections over the highways bridges and stairs and other things to get to the riverfront. And next slide, we'd replace that with, with uh, uh, 13 different access points throughout the downtown so that this new accessible riverfront really does become accessible to the public in, in, a, in a, a number of ways, number of places. Next, please. This is what it looks like now, it's very elegant, makes you wanna be there, doesn't it? And just as, uh, why, why wouldn't you go out of your way to go upstairs and down? through underpasses and through the highway to get to this lovely riverfront? And the answer is nobody in their right mind would want to bother. Next, please. And you know, an image of, of what the alternative might look like. There is a levee there that has to be rebuilt. It's 70 years old, it is failing. Connecticut River floods routinely and has flooded downtown in the past. And as part of this project, we'd be, we'd be restoring the, this uh, 70 year old levee and then providing public access across the levee. Into, into the riverfront. Next, please. And you can see there's a wide expanse of parkland that's created where the where the Interstate 95 is uh, currently the, and with, the, with the interstate um, uh, lowered down and put in a trench with the levee restored. Why this is this place is good to go for the next hundred years. And again, this is a really attractive new you know a place that you might want to locate yourself. At your your home or your business into a city that has a waterfront like this one. Next, please. Uh, East Hartford across the river, the same thing. This is an aerial view of the Mixmaster, you know, the interchange that blew up half of downtown East Hartford 70 years ago. Next. And, and then with the Mixmaster relocated, uh, we create a new district here. There's a, a new Central Park and then a new, uh, we're calling it Midtown. Uh, East Hartford and East Hartford, you know, kind of regains its its place in uh, in the central Connecticut economy. Next, please. Uh, the the, flood, the, the uh, flood walls that were built just after the Second World War <clears throat> create a lot of high value land uh, that doesn't flood in East Hartford. And then we and then next, please, you know, we put behind those walls we put a highway interchange, which makes no sense. It, you know, create valuable land that doesn't flood along the river. That's just the wrong thing to do. Next, please. So this is where we end up. You know, we create several hundred acres of developable land in both Hartford and East Hartford. We reconnect uh, the North and South ends so they're largely minority populations with the economic core. Hartford is, uh, is st still has, I think it's 150,000 jobs in a city with 130,000 people. So it's a major employment center already with the insurance industry, with uh, the tech, tech industry of Pratt & Whitney and, and uh, other tech companies, uh, with the state capital and its employment located here. So this means that Hartford can once again be, you know, assume its role as the, not one of the leading economic uh, uh, drivers of the Northeast economy. Next, please. 
uh, and, and a, a look at how this whole place might uh, might might be. And you know, we're now working on some ground level views and and uh, proposals. My uh, colleague Kip Bergstrom has proposals for uh, self builder. Uh, uh, small small cap developers, minority developers, being able to to build new housing in and around the downtown, uh, so that so that it isn't just rich people who get to live here after all of this investment is made. Uh, we've put together a proof of concept plan, uh, working with Hartford 400 and with a team of engineers at WSP, one of the big national and international uh, civil engineering and planning firms. Uh, the highway project works from a highway point of view. It eliminates the second biggest highway bottleneck in New England, which is the I-91-84 interchange. It decongests the whole core of the region, uh, uh, provides enormous transportation benefits. And in the middle of this, of course, is the North Atlantic rail tunnel built under the, under the center of the city. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, Hartford gets to be the hub of the Northeastern uh, transportation system once again. I, I think I could stop there. I mean, I've got, I think we got one or two more slides, but I, but I think this is a good place to stop. And, and we've got about a half hour for, for Q&A and I can add other um, dimensions that people are interested, but let's, not that okay with you, open it up to question and answer. Again, so our goal is to get, I, this is a, we're not kidding. This is a hundred billion dollar rail project, a $20 billion uh, 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 downtown revitalization, highway redesign project. That's a lot of money. Uh, the mm -hmm. only reason that we could contemplate doing this is that is, is if it ends up being a part of the president's uh, ambitious national infrastructure program. But, uh, you know, we think this would be uh, transformational for uh, Long Island and the Northeast. And again, that, that this illustration of Hartford of what's possible to, to build on this new uh, economic geography, new economic advantage that Hartford gains. Same kind of thing would be true in a number of places on Long Island and, uh, and across New England if we did this. Okay, I'll stop there. Well, well, thank you, Bob. This is truly visionary, and um, we'd like to hear more about how such things happened. A, a question popped up from um, <clears throat> Josie Alla, uh, and it's on Long Island. It's LaGuardia Airport that's notoriously difficult to get to. And this, this, is, this is a little diff separate from what you were talking about, but are you, are you um, familiar with what about, it's easier, about the problem? What you talked about was it'd be easier to get to Bradley International Airport than for anyone to get to LaGuardia. Well, I think the answer is that you might not need to get to LaGuardia, that, that in fact, uh, you'd have access, <clears throat> you know, with a, a little over an hour to Logan Airport to, uh, uh, to uh, international airports, you know, in, at Bradley and at uh, uh, TF Green and uh, west of Providence. Uh, MacArthur, it becomes, you know, MacArthur becomes a real airport with, with a service area that, you know, includes uh, uh, 30 million people, something like that. And so they're just part of Long Island. Uh, so I think we're going to see, and what, what I think is likely to happen is that, is that the New York airports uh, would end up focusing on, on longer distance services. Uh, you know, they're all out of capacity. And even with the upgrades that, that Governor Cuomo has, has uh, initiated at LaGuardia, and, and at JFK, you know, they're not adding runway capacity. They, they uh, are always going to, they're, they're pretty close. They, you know, before the pandemic, they were, they were at the limits of their capacity. Uh, so I think you'll see a reconfiguration of, of air service and uh, uh, all of these, you know, formerly isolated regional airports become accessible on the system, you know, in basically less than an hour from, uh, from Long Island and from, you know, most of Southern New England. <clears throat> um, and, you know, you want, you got, want an inter international flight, you probably could take it out of Logan as easily as you could. But, you know, we'd be providing, I don't know, 50 minute, 45, 50 minute service to Newark Airport if you wanted to, you know, access Newark, which, which right now from Long Island is almost an overnight trip. <laughs> um, so everything changes, you know, and LaGuardia is not on this, on this, uh, on this system. Uh, the, the Port Authority and MTA are, are working on a connection via the Port Washington branch of the Long Island Railroad, which, uh, you know, is not part of the system. Um, I don't know, my, my sense is LaGuardia, when we did a lot of work with the Port Authority and the region's airports. And uh, at, despite all the uh, complaints about LaGuardia, you could basically get to LaGuardia even in the rush hour and from Midtown or lower Manhattan, 35, 40 minutes, something like that. 
And uh, you know, the real problem was getting to JFK or getting to Newark. And uh, uh, Newark Airport, the new master plan calls for re you know, putting the central terminal on the on the Northeast Corridor so that you'd be able to get from uh, Stony Brook to the, to, to, the, to the terminal at Newark in less than an hour. Uh, that changes everything. There's a question from Mary, uh, Bob. How do Long Islanders access high-speed rail if it only stops in Manhattan and then Connecticut? In other words... Well, you, Mary... may, have, you may have missed the, 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 the service plan calls for new stations uh, in several locations. Uh, uh, Jamaica slash JFK, the Nassau hub, Route 110 Republic you know, in Farmingdale, uh, Ronkonkoma, and Stony Brook. So, so you should be able to find one of those stations and you'd be on the main line, the main stem of the Northeast Corridor high-speed rail service. There's a question from um, Merza. Uh, environmental impacts on Long Island of the project from Ronkonkoma to Stony Brook. Is it, I suppose she's saying, is it above ground, below ground, if, or on the ground? And what about all the level crossings of trains that are going very, very fast? So a lot of this will be tunneled or uh, it, most of it, some of it deep bore tunnel, you know, so where we've got to get under, under urban fabric or, you know, dense population centers and in other places where we're using existing, for the most part, we're using existing rail corridors or, or power lines. Uh, and in those, and most of those places we would be uh, doing cut and cover. We'd put, put the railroad in a trench. We would take existing rail uh, lines <clears throat> Uh, and put those in a trench. Some of them would end up being four track uh, uh, sections of trench uh, where That's there are great. overhead power lines, those would be put in the trench. And so you'd end up in most places where you have a, currently have a scar of a rail corridor and, and dozens of, of, of uh, grade crossings with all the safety issues that go with them and disruption that goes with those. And those would be all you know put underground. And uh, uh, so, so uh, you know, it, it, there would uh, clearly be construction impact, impacts during a one or two year period when the thing is being built. You know, neighbors would know about it, but after that, they'd end up with a greenway or a bike trail where there had been a freight line or a power right away. Melanie, can you take the uh, slideshow down so we can see uh, each other and Bob talking? Yeah. Okay, there's a question from uh, Paul, the Dean, and now, where is it? Um, The question is, I can't see it, but it was to do with what's a reasonable time frame that this might be uh, completed? We're proposing to have the whole thing finished in 20 years. I didn't go into, uh, we have, we've got a set of very uh, detailed project delivery proposals that are gonna be needed to achieve that objective, beginning with the creation of a new uh, federal state partnership uh, that we're calling North Atlantic Rail Inc. Uh, that would be a joint venture between the states and the federal government, but a freestanding of public authority uh, that has the has the you know the powers to deliver this whole project. And we're also talking about a set of uh, uh, ventures that I first uh, uh, learned about and, and and participated in with the new Tappanzi Bridge that that enabled that project to proceed in you know a third the time and half the cost that folks thought it was going to take. Accelerated permitting, design, build, procurement, uh, uh, project labor agreements to address uh, uh, traditional labor practices and work rules, uh, and and other. Uh, the, one idea is, is just, there are about thirty different segments to this thing, pieces of this project, and and we would probably break the break the project down into you know, what I would call bite-sized pieces, but but functional pieces that could be delivered simultaneously. Uh, so, for example, on the Tappanzi Bridge, you know, we we used a, a procedure that the Obama administration uh, put in place called the dashboard, where for the first time they they had an agency person, high level person, whose job it was was to put the the, the EIS review process on a critical path, and then to, and then to check in on a weekly basis with the participating agencies, federal and state agencies, to make sure that they were uh, sticking to the critical path. Uh, uh, simultaneous uh, uh, consecutive reviews by agencies instead of simultaneous reviews and so forth. On the TAP, we got a record of decision on the EIS 
in nine months, you know, which everyone had said before that was going to take nine years. Uh, using design build procurement uh, as opposed to the more onerous and contentious and lit litigious design bid build process that it's used, you know, we ended up uh, having having a, a, a design and construction team selected uh, and with a project, a project construction start in 14 or 15 months. Uh, we used a best value procurement instead of low bid procurement. So that we got a team that, that, that we had enormous confidence in their ability to get the project done and, and in a high quality way and so forth, as opposed to the you know, low bid stuff where you never know what you're gonna end up with. Save a few bucks at the beginning, but end up taking a lot more time and spending a lot of, wasting a lot more money down the road. So a whole series of those innovations would be built, would be incorporated into this project delivery uh, process so that we could get this thing done in 20 years. Uh, Malcolm and I want to be able to want to be able to roll down the uh, veranda from the nursing home in our wheelchairs, right? Right, Malcolm, and uh, get to use this thing. Other questions? Uh, how come, Azima, you have your hand up? Just turn your mic on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, great talk. I, you you mentioned ratio. This project addresses ratio and social justice, and I can yes. see that for for Hartford. I, I didn't quite see that in terms of how the railway is located and the, the stations are located on Long Island. Uh, maybe you can elaborate on that. The other thing is if I'm, I could be a devil's advocate, I could say this is too Hartford centric. And what if other states came up and said, look here, uh, Connecticut is getting 90% of the construction and so all jobs are gonna go there and the investment, but we're getting only 10%. Well, for the first part, I mean, basically these, uh, the, uh, most of these uh, old manufacturing centers, uh, former manufacturing centers in New England have very large minority populations. Uh, uh, you know, all of you know, uh, low household income, low educational attainment, uh, high unemployment, uh, lowered life expectancy, morbidity, and so forth. I mean, all the things that go with having high concentrations of, of, of minority <clears throat> communities that don't have a lot of economic opportunities. And so these places all, you know, will have access, you know, again, a place like, like a Holyoke, Massachusetts, for example, which is, you know, a city of, of 50,000 people, it, you know, it's a majority minority community, mostly Latino community. Um, and right now, you know, they're in a, they're in a labor market that, that, you know, might include, uh, you know, 50,000 jobs, something like that in Western Massachusetts with this system, they, they, they become part of a single labor market that stretches across most of, most of New England. Uh, so it creates enormous opportunities for new, for access to jobs. We're also proposing that as part of the, the, the design and construction of this thing, that the training programs be be put in place that would be aimed at minority uh, uh, workers so that they get access to the construction jobs, to the design jobs and so forth. Um, and, you know, this is, we hope this is gonna be the beginning of an entirely new industry in this country. There, there are several other places across the country that are also proposing high-speed rail uh, uh, systems. Uh, if, we're, if we're smart, we'll make sure that all of the manufacturing associated with these, uh, with these systems is gonna be uh, uh, or, or as much of it as possible is going to be domestic manufacturing. So new, new, uh, new job creation, uh, you know, in the construction, but also in the in fabricating them, uh, all of the systems and so forth. Uh, you know, to, this is Hartford centric because Hartford has uh, has taken the initiative to say, hey, how can we capitalize on this thing? Uh, I would urge uh, uh, and will urge Long Islanders and folks in other parts of the seven state region. To do the same thing, to take some initiative, and you know you got to get off your butts and and uh, 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 take some initiative uh, to make things happen. Things don't happen automatically, you know. So, uh, so at any rate, so I, I you know I, we're working with Steve Ballone and Laura Curran and others on the Island Long Island Association to advance this thing, and and uh, Steve Ballone has done more than anybody on the island to to uh, to lead revitalization efforts initially in the town of Babylon where he, where he was supervisor and then across Suffolk County and, and uh, downtowns across Suffolk County. 
we're having a conversation with Steve about whether we need it, whether we should add a station in Wyandanche, for example, which has a large minority population, and Steve's already gotten a lot of development um, underway. In I had a con conversation yesterday with a with the town supervisor Brookhaven uh, Ed Romain, who was very interested in your presentation, and I don't know if he's on the call today, but <clears throat> town of Brookhaven is uh, has a very diverse population. Uh, Melanie, you yes. had a question written down. Do you want to just uh, read it out or, or, or ask a uh, speaker? So my question was about like the construction of, um, I guess, the rail system and um, the waterfront in Hartford. So I was wondering if you would use e-concrete, which is like an environmentally safe concrete um, that wouldn't affect marine ecosystems. Um, it's not very popular yet, but I was curious if you would use that in alignment with environmentally friendly um, plans? Well, I think I, we haven't gotten into that level of detail, but I think the answer is yes, we're gonna use whatever we have to, to uh, whatever steps we could take to minimize environmental impacts. We're very interested in seeing uh, 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 Bill Gates's proposal the other day about, about uh, uh, a, a new concrete that's fabricated with, with uh, carbon to ba basically se sequester, con uh, uh, car instead of producing car, you know, more carbon in, in the manufacturing and installation of, of poured concrete that we'd actually be taking carbon out of the atmosphere and basically uh, uh, sequestering it in, in, uh, in reinforced concrete uh, uh, portions of this, of this project. I think we will we'll, we'll do everything we can to make all these things happen. Well, there's a question coming from uh, Steve Schwartz. Uh, Steve is a uh a cloud physicist at Brookhaven National Lab and also an yeah. adjunct at SOMAS. And, and Steve says, uh, have you thought about maglev in lieu of conventional rail? Maglev allows individual cars to stop at individual stations without requiring the whole train to stop at each station. Steve, you just, uh, you can speak up. Yeah, I think you, that, that, that's the essence of my question. Uh, maglev is is well suited also for tunnels, uh, so you're not against you're not dealing with the uh, wind resistance of being above the ground. So I would uh, give some serious consideration to maglev. Uh, it, it offers a lot of potential. Uh, the answer is we've looked at it, and I think because this thing is just so thoroughly integrated with the existing rail system, uh, which is a steel wheel on rail you know system. So that we can get in and out of Penn Station, for example, um, and uh, in and out of the, you know, we've got it, we're, we're using existing uh, steel wheel on rail uh, segments in the existing Northeast <clears throat> Corridor and in a number of places. That it simply the most prudent thing is to do what basically the rest of the world is doing is to is to uh, take the high speed rail technology that's developed uh, since the 1960s uh, in Europe and Asia and now in dozens of countries and use that. I mean, we always hear about that. And then, you know, we've got uh, Mr. Musk's uh, 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 proposal for, you know, for vacuum tubes and that sort of thing. <laughs> I, I, my biggest concern is that if we, if we spend the next 10 years pondering which technology to use, we're gonna be that much farther behind the rest of the world. And uh, I will watch and see what happens. There's a proposal for a maglev line in, in uh, between Washington and Baltimore, which is in the, environmental impact statement process. We'll see if that moves forward. You know, if it, I, I suspect that it will not, that in fact, uh, Amtrak is proposing to upgrade uh, service in what they call the South End between New York and DC to cut travel time in half. And, and that, that, that will probably be the, uh, be the preferred uh, mode uh, in, in that section of the Northeast Corridor. Okay, you, you, you've thought about it and it isn't perhaps ripe enough yet if that's fine. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and until it can be uh, integrated with the existing rail system, it just doesn't work in a place like the Northeast where we're, you know, we're basically retrofitting this thing uh, into, uh, you know, an existing steel wheel on rail uh, system. There's a question from Bob Alla, uh, um, and Bob, you can speak up, but I wonder if the net result will be the paving of New England, that is conversion of virtually the entire region into a regional Manhattan equivalent. I would think that a regional transportation system should involve integrated planning for land use associated with transport systems. Well, my, my uncle, uh, 
used used to run a manufacturing company, and he would come into Thanksgiving when uh, dinner and when when posed with a challenge like who's doing the dishes tonight, and he would he would always begin by saying, "Well, I only work here," and uh, uh, you know, and so you know, we're not setting out to fix all of the uh, environmental and social problems of the world. Uh, I've had conversations with mayors and first selectmen from a number of New England communities, and I've said if we do this. You know, so for example, a little town of Guilford that I live in, uh, you know, which is currently uh, two and a half hours to, to both New York and to, to uh, Boston, a very slow rate of growth for the last 30 or 40 years and so forth. And we told the, the first selectman that, that, that if we pull this thing off, that Guilford is going to need a serious uh, uh, growth, you know, growth management or smart growth strategy, as, as will other places across New England. And again, I would argue it's the kind of challenge we want to have in a place that's been, you know, it, it, some some of these places have been in terminal decline for 50 years or more. So we got to do it. Absolutely. You know, the, earlier in my career, the, 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 the uh, uh, Center for Rural Massachusetts uh, created the first smart growth campaign in Massachusetts, in the country in, for Massachusetts in the 19, mid, mid 1980s. And, you know, I spent a big part of my career working on smart growth. We absolutely need to do that. But again, that's the kind of problem you like to have, which is managing success as opposed to managing decline, which is what we've been doing across um, uh, much of Long Island and most of New England for the last 40 years. Is it true that you co you personally coined the term smart growth? I did indeed. <laughs> that's, that's created a lot of interest. Um, there's a question here from Julia. Are there any plans for high-speed rails to go into the parts of upstate New York throughout Western New York? I've taken Amtrak up to Boston from New York City, and that is a very beautiful train ride, but the trains can be up to four hours late on a regular basis. Yeah. North of Albany, the tracks are owned by Canadian Pacific Railway. They give freight trains priority. If there's any slip in the sequencing, the passenger trains are shunted off to the side. Yeah, so uh, Governor Cuomo, I think, is has proposed that, that a similar network be created for upstate New York. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration, the, you know, he campaigned in support of creating a national network of high-speed rail lines in mega regions across the country. So, uh, you know, my hope is that, is that we'll see that and others uh, Emerge so again. I know. Of, I know of the close to a dozen different high-speed rail proposals across the country, some of which may be funded as part of this this infrastructure program this spring. Uh, it didn't surprise me to see a second tranche of these things coming along uh, in coming years. Uh, How come I need to get off in about seven minutes? So I know. Yep, I've got I understand. Another... You've got you've yeah. got an appointment with the mayor of Hartford. Yeah. Um, we can keep chatting amongst ourselves. Um, then if people want to stay on a few minutes uh, from Alex. Alex says, I appreciate the phase one focus on important regional rail upgrades. There's a lot of value there. That said, have you seen the cost benefit analysis of the South Coast rail preferred alternative in Massachusetts? And then uh, in parentheses also, it would be good to share my slides with colleagues if you're able to share. Well, we can try that after the hour, Alex, but um, can you respond to that, Bob? Yeah, I, 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 no, I have to say I haven't read the the cost benefit analysis for South Coast Rail. I know, I know the uh, MBTA and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are, are are committed to building that. I know we've had discussions about, uh, you know, again that's that's a project that's been starved for capital for a decade or longer. Uh, our uh, one of our partners in North Atlantic Rail is a group called Transit Matters. Uh, in Boston, that that has proposed a, a dramatic transformation of the of the uh, MBTA commuter rail network, including South Coast Rail. Uh, so we're taking our cues from them. They've identified a different alignment that if uh, that is included in North Atlantic Rail and funding for that improved alignment would be uh, part of our funding request uh, to the Biden administration. Uh, we'll come back to that, Alex, uh, if you have some slides you want to share, uh, but we'll just carry on. There's a, one more question I have here from Frank. Given the extensive miles of tunnels, will ventilation shafts pop up following the tunnels, creating an eyesore and a problem for the commute, co sorry, communities above the tunnels? 
I think the answer is that these are all going to be all electric trains. So I don't, I'm not sure that we're going to need ventilation shafts in many places. And like anything else, they'll be, if, they, if we do need them, they'll be cited as part of a, a you know, a, a collaborative process with communities to find the least uh, objectionable locations. Look, they're going to be, uh, you know, I, I, in a career doing big public works projects in the Northeast, you know, I can tell you that that uh, every project, you know, uh, every project generates highly localized NIMBY opposition. You know, it's, and, 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 I, and the way I put it is that, is that these projects like this provide uh, wide ranging, region wide uh, and long range benefits. It's very hard to turn out a room full of people from across a region as big as this in support of it. Uh, but they also generate highly localized and sometimes offensive uh, 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 in, uh, impacts that you know that that are the things that result in NIMBY opposition. And it's very easy to turn out a room of people opposing a project from a from a locality. I mean, I worked on you know uh, on the uh, uh, East Side Access Second Avenue Subway, the Arc Extension uh, Tunnel Extension to the West Side of Manhattan, the Columbia University Campus Expansion in Harlem, the NYU Campus Expansion. Uh, and you know, as we were we, at RPA, we were the leading advocates for for these projects: uh, a third third rail on Long Island, third rail on the Harlem Line, and so forth. Uh, and it takes a lot of persistence to, to to build the broader regional support for these things to overcome the NIMBY opposition. But you just have to do it. So, Bob, I have a quick question in terms of yeah. the tun tunneling technology. This. This 15 mile tunnel under Long Island Sound, how would it compare to the channel underneath the English Channel that joins London to Paris? Half the length of the channel tunnel. It's also half the length of the tunnel that uh, Boris Johnson uh, has proposed to link uh, Scotland with Northern Ireland. It's a 32 mile tunnel. And if you just Google uh, uh, long distance rail tunnels, it's kind of an adventure. There are different sites that pop up. Uh, on one, I counted more than 100 tunnels that were longer than our proposed Long Island Sound tunnel that have been built in the last 10 years around the world, mostly in Asia, but also in Europe. And what's and, your view and of it? So, you know, we'll take a look at it. This is this is now off the shelf technology. Uh, it's being used all over the world. You know, we are, you know, I, I, I'm coming around to the notion that if we can't adopt some of these technologies, why we might as well, we'll have to see if there are peat deposits on Long Island that we can start digging for heat and light. You know, that's, you know, because we're, we're going to end up with a, as a formerly developed country. The rest of the world is moving ahead with these things. They're overcoming NIMBY opposition. They're doing things and we need to do likewise. What's your view of Elon Musk the other day? He said he, he would drill the, the train tunnel under the Hudson River for about 5% of what the, it was presently considered to cost. Do I have well, I don't know. I, I look, I think they could probably find some economies. You remember Chris Christie, canceled the $11 billion project, the ARC tunnels, in order to save New Jersey taxpayers some money, he said, and it's now a $30 billion project. It's $30 billion project because I've added a lot of stuff to it, you know, it's, uh, uh, expanding Penn Station uh, uh, and a lot of other stuff, you know, but I think they could find some economies in that. I doubt that, and maybe, I don't know what, what Musk was talking about. I, I suspect it was his, his uh, vacuum tube, uh, uh, system, which again is not going to work because it won't connect to anything on either side. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Bob, I know you've got to run. You have this appointment yeah. with the mayor of Hartford, but look, thanks very much. And uh, Bob yeah. is an adjunct professor at SOMAS. So, when life gets back to normal, I hope you'll you'll come down in person and interact with us more. Malcolm, and, I look I look forward to it. I think it would be great to to see folks face to face and in person. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, 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 bye folks. Be successful, Bob. Oh, thanks so much. Appreciate all your all your support. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.